I could not sing in public. I was the shyest kid you'd ever met. And my performing debut came later on in high school for a homecoming game, the national anthem. Well, I was shaking so bad, I was trembling. I clenched onto that microphone so tightly when I finished, I could not open my hand. It was stuck. But I was taught to run to my fears, so I kept singing the anthem at every chance I had. I would sing through college, and that would lead to uh, pro games, Nassau Coliseum, Madison Square Garden. Uh, I even took a job with a major league lacrosse team under one condition. They let me sing the anthem at every game possible. And the anthem kind of became my thing. And then there was a pivotal performance. It actually happened here in the city for BGC, the spinoff of Cantor Fitzgerald, for a 9-11 memorial. And to say the audience was emotional is an understatement. And it was in that moment that I realized that leading people in the singing of our national anthem is an honor. And it's, it's not about me. And when I continue to sing, I get to interact with people in our military and our veterans. And I get to hear their stories of their service and many times see what they sacrificed. And I'd share these experiences with my mom because she was always urging me, you know, to see the big picture. She'd say, Janine, your talent's not just for fame and fortune, you know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but I also wanted Grammys, my own line of perfume. <laughs> and that obsession eventually led to the development of a phrase that I would say so many times, and it would lead to so many problems. Was that phrase? I'd say, don't worry about it. When I make it big, then I'll give back. I'll take care of everybody. It sounded good. But in reality, I was really indefinitely putting off the giving back part. It was actually make it big, or bust. <laughs> and eventually I had the opportunity to go out to Los Angeles and record another album. So phew, I was off. It was going to take three months. And this is how it was going to go. I was going to record the album, get a deal, go on tour. Bing, bang, boom, right? Well, three months turned into five years. <laughs> I was that girl back in high school who was clenching onto that microphone so tightly out of fear that my hand was stuck. Well, now I was this grown woman, but clenching onto confusion, frustration, exhaustion, and my life was stuck. I was good at hiding this from most people, except, of course, my mom. You know, she never really wanted me out in LA in the first place, but there was a point in time when she became pretty emotional about me coming back home. It turns out she was sick. And when I got that call, I was on the next flight home. And I'd be home for what would be the last eight months of her life. The last three words that she ever said to me were, never forget me. Now, she knew I could never forget her. But looking back and knowing my mom, she meant never forget the lessons that I taught you. Talk about a paradigm shift. <laughs> Theodore Roosevelt said, do what you can with what you have where you are. And in the months after my mom's passing, I kind of started doing that. And I was thinking, you know, what could I do now with what I have from where I am? I was not thinking anymore about making it big. What did that even mean?